senses, and this, is, this goes to biology, but our senses are actually attuned to pick out differences. So imagine back when we were growing up in the, the steppes and the grasses of, of Africa, before we had culture and civilization and all that kind of stuff. Floating breeze, a couple birds, there's some giraffes walking, and something's rustling in the bushes, right? <laughs> who didn't notice the little things that were different, died. Between the smart monkeys that were noticing the person who's off. So when you're in rehearsal and you're like, ah, this person knocked it off, just remember that uh, you, you don't have to use this part of your brain, your like blue bomb and data, your reptilian cortex. Use your frontal lobes to remember tell them afterwards. And um, you know, there's also, I think now they have a uh, remote control wireless uh, electrophone. <laughs> 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 like, guys, that was a great, really great run. I felt it. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. well, sort of related, okay. but how do I turn on that like fire, the sparkle in the eyes ah. for performing? Yes. Some of my members they turn it on, it's like 110 percent, like, yeah. and then some members like I ne it never goes beyond just pleasant things. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
You know what I mean? Like, that wasn't, it's not that. And more importantly, that's what you spend all your time doing than when you actually get up in front of people. What if you have stage fright? What if you're not in the mood, right? All that kind of stuff. So, but also, you're exercising the wrong muscle. You're exercising the muscle of autopilot. You're exercising the muscle of meaningless repetition. So then when you get in front of people, all of a sudden they're supposed to turn it on, but they're doing something they're not used to doing. So we'll talk about many ways to make that happen, but a big, a big one of them is to make sure there are a lot of performances and to not allow them to not give everything when they're in the rehearsal. And once they've given everything to a song 50 times, the 51st time in front of people will be even easier, right? Right? And if it's a song that's heartbreaking, you better be sure that group was ready to have their hearts broken 50 times in rehearsal before the 51st time. Now, if you're stuck, like, let's go over the first two measures of the second verse, you don't have to go there then, but then when it's time, okay, back from the top, no phoning it in, this is for real. And then, <coughs> and then you have the opportunity in rehearsal to call them out, to draw them out, to say, you guys, you're absolutely on. You, I think you think that you're bigger than you are, but you're not. Like, you are giving me too much. The arms and the eyes, and I, like, it seems like it's not truthful. Dial it back and go deep. Like, then you can calibrate your choir so that hopefully when they're in front of people, if anything, it's where it was, or even a little bit more. And more importantly, and again, we'll talk about this more, so I don't go too deep, but the, the whole idea of overwhelm, the whole idea of, like, it just, it gets so, they get so caught up in the emotions they can't sing. Either they're excited and they're yelling and they're angry songs, or like it's sad songs and they're weeping and they can't even hold it, right? You, you need to tread that line many times to know where it is, and so each person knows how to refocus. No, I'm too far, I'm not really feeling it. I gotta go deeper, not too, you know what I mean? Because that actually is more important for almost every single person that's in your audience than two. Now, I realize in this room, I just lost half of you. <laughs> <laughs> but let me make this point, and I think I brought it up this morning a little bit. Nobody at the end of a long day says, I need to listen to the most in tune piece of music I have. Nobody in the going through the heartbreak is like, oh, it just, we're not more rhythmic accuracy, I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean that those things don't matter, it means that they're not the point. And you've heard awesome blues singers who are just sloppy all over the notes. You listen to Motown and it fills your heart with joy and that stuff is wildly out of tune by today's standards. I'm not saying you don't need to teach your groups to sing in tune as much as possible. I'm teaching you that if that is the point, if that is the thing you're spending all your time on, then you're reinforcing pronunciation, not connection. And if you're wondering why people are not coming back to your concerts so much, if you're wondering why your video stuff I know. Grandma said it was really nice when she saw me in middle school. And I was awesome! <laughs> no, it's, it's, you get it, right? You get it. We want honesty, we want heartbreak, we want those honest connections. And we're all, and we know it when we see it in other kinds of music. Right? Right? And, and actually, here's, here's a good example that doesn't hit so close to home, but you know what? How many times do you go to hear a classical music concert, and, and even if it's this crystal and beauty to it, often you're just kind of like, you appreciate it if you didn't love it. And then other times you'll go down to a farmer's market and maybe there's like a family group there of some bluegrass guys, and they're just playing. And they're amateurs. But the root of the word amateur is amour, love. And if you feel that love, that might be the best performance of your audience. Right? I heard Stevie Wonder in concert when I was in college. I had every album, I knew every song I idolized one of the greatest musicians of our time. Without, it's not even something you could question. But I could just look at his face and I could tell he wasn't really into it. And I was like, oh. And he sang all the hits and people were loving it in the audience, but I didn't get that, right? And then uh, shortly before that, I, I was uh, back at my old high school and they were doing kind of an exchange with uh, an inner city school. And the, and the group was uh, singing three-part harmony, Moonglow, Jim Kellington. It must have been Moonglow. And they were yelling. I mean, they were yelling. And it was uh, like gospel-y kind of harmonies and whatever. And I, it was like, I was like that, the guy in the speaker commercial from the, like, with the hair pulled back. And whatever. <laughs> it was just raw, honest, unadulterated passion. We need that. We need that 
and barbershop because that's what's going to bring it into the next generation. That's what's going to compel people. People are going to be sitting in the audience. They may be five years old, they may be 50 years old, but they'll see it and they'll say, I want to do that. And honestly, how much you love seeing that performance is, is only a little bit of what's getting judged. So then you have to decide, like, And, and don't get me wrong, this is not me saying that there shouldn't be any judging. This isn't me saying that the fundamental nature of speed battling organization is broken, because it's not. It's, 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 a, it's a challenging dichotomy that you need. You need to preserve a form which then needs some boundaries. And most art through time has existed by breaking through boundaries. Why was throwing chords in there that shouldn't have been there? You know, I mean, everybody, like, let's go, let's press something new. Sometimes the boundary breaking doesn't work, but either way, that's how the progress happens. And yet, this has to be reined in. So then I think the artistry and the really compelling performances are the things that make this music from 100 years ago come alive. And that harmony is really important. Your love for each other, that sisterhood, that connection, the pure joy of singing. That's what, if you can tap into that in rehearsal repeatedly, your singers will first of all leave rehearsal feeling just exhilarated. And more importantly, when they get up on stage, they'll all be really good that's that's the game. That's the game. You do that anyway. <laughs> and I don't care if you have a gold medal. You're gonna have twice as many people in the choir. You have more views. You're gonna have more people come to your concerts. You're gonna know that you're making the world a better place. And and then other people will start following you. What are they doing? How do they get so many more people in the choir? How do they get so many more ticket sales? And they're getting invitations to go on on, on all these tours. That's what's gonna do it. Thank you for letting me go on that so long. <laughs> <laughs> of the way of, of the, the notes and the rhythms and how they align, and then there's the overall feel and the snare being slightly behind and all that. Um, uh, side note, but to the point, when I was in Brazil in the festival, in the festival maybe a decade ago, right before me there were some music educators, the room was filled with music educators, and they were all like kind of singing a little song, like a little warm-up song all together, and every single one of them, we <laughs> not. It was like, dun, 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 dun. and like I saw from the back of that term, and they're all kind of doing these weird, complex polyrhythms and just samba, 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 all of them, because that's their language and that's their culture. So they completely had it nailed, right? Could they sing a gene curling arrangement? No. They couldn't get anywhere near it, right? Could they do the kind of overtone ringing that we do? But no, no, no. So that's, that's just to say that part of it is exposure. So I would say the first thing to do, if there's a particular feel you want with your group, I would send around some tunes, have everybody really listen to them and get a sense of them. Listen while you're eating, listen to, you know, listen while you're driving, and get that feel into your backbone. If that is the right way to say it. And then you can start going into an analyzing what that is and, and how and, and how that really works. Um, but it probably with an entire choir of amateurs, it's gonna end up being toward it, but not it, which is okay. You know, realistically, if you have a pop choir and they sing the, the Beatles <coughs> Ave Maria, it's not gonna be Chanticleer, it's not gonna be classical, but it's gonna be beautiful and it's gonna be their version of it. Just like when Barbara Streisand recorded a for like album of classical music. Some of it's like, oh, that's really nice. Others you're like, well, I wouldn't have done that. But, you know. <laughs> but also when you're dealing with an amateur choir, it's fun to watch them do their thing. So. And I do have a book coming out on the Elephant Amazon soon um, uh, called Acapella Warm-Ups for Pop and Jazz Choirs. And what it is is rather than all of the Mame Mi Mu Mu warm-ups that everybody does or even some pretty like simple block chords, this is 50 plus or a 16 measure ditties 
songs that you can sing, and some of them specifically are focused on groove <coughs> or rhythm, and others are focused on blend and whatever, and, and uh, they're like tiny little mini songs. And you can take them up and step, down step, like all kinds of different things that you can do with them. But that will help a little bit. And then the last thing I'd say is, generally speaking, the person who really needs to be locked into a group, if you have that person, is a vocal percussionist. Because then they're throwing down the beat. And then everybody else will be able to <coughs> relate to that and, and sit into and find their way into that pocket, if that makes sense. Or bring some congas up on stage and like go in that direction because and bring in a Latin drummer. Why not? Right? Uh, so then that, those, I think those will all help. Yeah. But it's something you inch up towards. It's not a Latin drummer. And now we're a Latin drummer. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Oh, they, oh, come on. Guys, you have to have questions. Yeah, you came here like, well, I, I'm, I'm great. But I know the others. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> all right. Val, what's up? Ah, uh, I would uh, put them on a plane to America and have them like live in Harlem for six months. No, no. Um, what I would do is I would say uh, YouTube is your friend. There is so much great information online, so many great instructional videos. And uh, beatboxing in particular is something that a lot of different people with a lot of different techniques have, have mastered and they're teaching online. So you get people who are like hip hop beatboxers and then you get people who are real vocal percussionists, which is the tradition more that I started to come from, where, where you're really imitating, imitating the sound of the drums, and rather than being in the forefront, as a beatboxer often is, a vocal percussionist really sits mm -hmm. into the group. And they sound like drums, and, the, and they're not flashy. They're super consistent, though. And then there are all kinds of other sounds and cool ideas and, and, and whatnot. <coughs> the place I'd probably start is a website that I started with, with Google, which is acapella.how, H-O-W. And there's a whole section on vocal percussion in there. And that's by no means the entirety of educational vocal percussion videos. That's just the beginning of what's there. But there's some really good ones. Here's how you get a basic snare sound. Here's a basic hi-hat, kick drum. OK, now here's, here are some basic patterns you can put together. And then you kind of go from there. And know that you don't have to become a master vocal, vocal percussionist or beatboxer to be able to start using it in your group. You can start out with some really simple patterns, like on a jazz song. It's, you put that over the top of it, and then you learn a, like a hi-hat and a snare and a kick. And then you can do and just, just have that pattern for a song, you know, and then and then go from there. But it's you know, it, it, it sounds harder than it is. You guys as singers, you can all be beatboxing in a short period of time. Very, you know, straightforward patterns. And then the real consistency is the issue and, and, and being able to breathe and keep it going. And another thing you're going to find is that some people just take to it more. So I would find those people. That's actually your, your biggest job. Find the people who are both interested in it, like compelled to learn more, and the people who have a good, natural sense of group. And then wind them up and send them at it. Because you've got better things to do with your time. you got shot college. <laughs> What age is like? Is this a school thing or an? No, my my chorus is 21 to 83 years old. Wow. Okay. And uh, but we're 13 singers now, and they're feeling a little bit deflated and defeated right now. And so I think the way you can pull out the stops is to create successes for them, and the successes come in the form not of competitions, although that's so much a part of this culture. Look to the outside world and find opportunities for you to perform that'll be both emotionally and or just are exciting. So for instance, if you can get in contact with a local morning show on the radio and they are they there's something going on in the news and you have a song and you can change the lyrics to it a little bit. Or you've got a, a current song and you want to go on and sing something. Whatever it is, having your guys drop by the new drive time radio in the morning, they're always looking for new wacky things. And and, and it could be local news. Like it doesn't have to be some. Just make it about your community. Make it about something that's going on. And then all of a sudden, if you start building that relationship with the radio person, 
everyone's talking about you. And it's so fun for people who haven't been on the radio before, like to sing on the radio and have everybody give them. Or a local television channel. And it could be an afternoon thing, it could be a morning thing, it could be a whatever. Um, find other ways to get woven into the community. Schools of opportunities. I mean, you can sing at a farmer's market, but people passing by might be more more or less than anything else, which is why find that captive audience. Uh, sporting events, singing the national anthem in front of, uh, of a bunch of people. Um, these are all the things that I'm offering are, are good for everyone, and they're pretty easy. Like, oh, you're going to show up and perform for us for free? We love that. Um, and look for other opportunities to, you know, to get in front of people in your community. You can talk to local theaters and concert halls and whatever and say, do you need any opening acts for any, even if they drop out 48 hours beforehand, let us know. We can come on stage and do five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. You want someone to perform before the show in the lobby or during your mission, come and just sing some songs, let us know. And you may contact a bunch of theaters, but then you find the right one and you get that right connection. And then all of a sudden, hey guys, so it's, excuse me, so and so's coming to town. We'll let, you know, let's. Uh, tell everybody, and now we've performed with this friend, and then you get a quote from them at the show, oh, these guys are really great, or whatever, and then it's on your website. And those things feel valuable to young, or to, to, to uh, amateur students. They feel like, oh, now we're doing something of interest. Plus, then you reach many more people who are like, I want to be a part of that thing. Um, the, the biggest challenge that you have in this kind of competitive format, so many people in these giant competitions that whittle down to one winner, uh, reminds me of the sign above Marty Munson's um, desk, which says competitions are mostly for losers. <laughs> <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of losers. <laughs> so you have you, you, you can't you can't you're gonna lose. You're all gonna lose over and over again. <laughs> and you can't measure you, and you can't motivate them. It's really tough, right? And then you also go in, and if it inspires a new young group, that's great. But then if it's demoralizing for them, well, we'll never be able to do that. Fine. I'm never going to be Bruce Springsteen, but it doesn't keep me from wanting to get in front of people and motivate them and sing. And I'll never have that audience. I'll never have that followership, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm doing something different. And hopefully I'm doing it the right way. So, you know, and I think you can also, the last thing I'd say is you can find ways to engage them in your process more because it's such a small group. What songs do you guys want to sing? What do you want to be the goals coming up this next six months? And 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 then and then yeah, and then dropping these kind of ideas. Would you guys be interested in this? Whatever. And also, if you can, engaging different members of the group to be involved in different things. Why don't you do social media for us? Why don't you reach out? Why don't you see if you can put together a little mini week, weekend tour? Why don't you see if you can get like a weekend retreat? Because also, people sing because they want the the feedback, but also part of it is connection. So if you can get some good like, even if it's a day long get together where you learn and someone comes in and works with you a little bit, but not like to compete, just to like be better and have more skills. Then hopefully all of that together will make your core group feel really great and then more will start joining. And 13 and 18 and different points. Open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it. <laughs> um, well, it's because we find that um, some of the more modern songs um, lose a little bit when you the translation in the arrangement to the barbershop. So Not mine, but no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're of course, of course. So, you know, so we've chosen to, you know, to take out of the classical experience like that. Worked really well for us and gave our singers opportunities to sing other parts. So here's here's the here's the thing. Um, in the early acapella world, a lot of the high schools, although some of them are new recording some stuff, or whatever, a lot of them are plugging it on the note or, or on the piano, or they're sending out mini files or whatever. Like they have a variety of different ways to teach this music. It's you guys are the ones who have part tracks, and it's a part of your world, and and it's a lovely thing. No, no, it's not. Listen to get an amateur singer singing. I don't care, right? Send them a canary. 
on their doorstep every morning. <laughs> Whatever gets in the sink, I'm fine with that. What I would say is um, the cost of recording those, unless you have someone who's absorbing the initial recording of it, is often, it's just too high and it's too much of a hassle. Like for instance, I've got 600 plus arrangements that are published that are out of Sheet Music Plus, and I'd say 50 of them maybe have fresh recordings. And yeah, I know, I know people would like the other ones, but does it cost justified to do it with all of them? I mean, that's a year's worth of work getting people to do it. So this is what I'll put to you guys. Any of you who do park stage and know people who do, if you want to do them for a song like Blackbird or have someone do them, then we can put them up online, including iTunes, and then we'll split the, the proceeds in perpetuity. So it's like a constant, ongoing stream of income, particularly if, if the song catches fire within the park shop community, a lot of other people are buying them and downloading them. And at 99 cents a copy, hopefully individuals are happening rather than, and this is the other problem, oh, well, I downloaded one copy and I sent it out to my choir of 45 people. So I hope that 99 cents you made feels good. <laughs> but it's not going to pay for someone to be in the studio. So it has to be in-house. The good news is I think that four-part arrangement has been done by somebody in the Sweet Adeline world. This is also something I didn't even know which ones. I, the original three part was, but somebody else was like, I, I just added a part of my own. I don't maybe it's not the same as a published one, but. It could be Jan Cook. It could be. It could be. Three yeah, yeah, but that's the thing. You guys know all these people. And so I have, there are recordings of arrangements of mine that I have never heard, I didn't know exist, and people are sharing them, and that's all fine with me. Like, I don't mind. All I care is that people are singing. Um, but if you guys know of or have a way, make those happen more easily and get them out to the world, that's great. I know a couple people do them, like Tim and the, uh, but it's it, like you guys pay him to make one, and I, what are you paying, $200 or something like that? Mm -hmm. Right, so I'd have to sell 200 copies at 99 cents. Oh no, wait, they take 17 cents, and then money has to go to the original <coughs> songwriter, that's most of it, so I'd make 10 cents. So I'd have to sell 2,000 copies of it for it to cost justify. This is the problem. So the mechanical license is paid by iTunes every time one's downloaded, or whatever. Mechanical licenses are easy. Print oh. licenses are the chance of challenge. No, 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 no. So it's all of a board. So if it gets put on iTunes, yeah. then the mechanical license is paid. By definition, that's what they do. That's why they exist. Like that's their big thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, and so they take 17 cents, and then they take a big chunk out for the songwriter, and then you get the whatever is remaining. But I, I, I'll. Bet you some of you guys have sent around and learning recordings and haven't paid every single copy of it, right? And you probably are freer with that than you are with sh print music because the society's really on you about print music, and yet recordings feel like, well, you know, people just share things and whatever. So you know what it feels like on both sides of the equation, is what I'm saying. That's the challenge. The less money that goes into an art form, the less people are able to read that art. For instance, a uh, really good friend of mine directs the Dallas Symphony Chorus. And he also has a group called the Desert Corral that performs in holidays and summers in um, New Mexico, uh, Santa Fe. And they're unbelievable. They are a world-class choir. They're like uh, Chanticleer, but there's 24 of them, mixed chorus, stunning. 15 years ago, they'd be making an album every year, every other year. Now, since he became director of this group like 15 years ago, they haven't made a single recording. They're going to finally do one in summer. But they've been sitting there selling the CDs of the old concerts, and nobody even buys those because and, and so if your margin, and so many record labels are folded, if your margin was 10% and your sales have dropped 40%, you don't have a business model. You don't have anything that makes any sense whatsoever. It's not even close. So they have to get donors to donate money to be able to pay for the recording time. And then the album is basically going to be a loss leader promotion tool for them. Mm -hmm. And even rock groups a lot. I don't know if you know this, and this is a little bit of a tangential thing, but as a music director, it's, it's good for you to know. Um, it used to be the case that people toured to promote albums. Albums were where they made the money. And record labels, there was just tons and tons of money in recordings. Then recordings went down, 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 down. Now, all the labels that are signing acts, they have what's called a 360 deal. I don't know if you realize this, but when Street and Chaser goes on the road, they pay a percentage of every concert back to the label. The label doesn't make a profit on their album. They make a profit on the fact that the group is on the album. They record the album, they get an advance for it, but Straight No Chaser would have more money in their pockets if they didn't even have a deal with the land records. Because the amount of money they get for the album, they, they could just do it on their own. Like That's where the recording industry is now. So that's the long way of saying, 
Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Chicken of the sea. Yep, yep, yep. But hopefully this all will get figured out one day. Yeah. Uh, going back to the question about the Latin, you know, the Latin beat, and, and you're, you, you've answered this partially. How do we help the individual singers in the chorus who are convinced they have no sense of rhythm and do everything they can to prove that they're right. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. You know, personal mythologies are difficult to break. And, um, and I think we all need those at some point in our life, because particularly as we get older, we need to categorize ourselves. I'm good at this, I'm not good at this. Um, and there are some things that everybody thinks they're good at, like driving. <laughs> the vast majority of Americans believe they're above average drivers. Math doesn't check out on that one. Um, but then on the other hand, it's like dancing. Like people are like, well, I can't dance. I'm not a dancer. I can't dance. And they haven't danced, but you know the one that we all fight against? I can't sing. I'm tone deaf. This is the bane of our existence. This has undermined the power of vocal music and harmony in our culture. It is the number one thing that I, that I tilt at windmills about my entire life. There are like three tone deaf people on the planet. They, their voices can't hear pitch, so they talk in a monotone all the time. And when they have a question, they don't go up at the end of it. Like it's literally there's no flow, because they can't hear differences in pitch. Someone who goes up to you and says, like, I'm tone deaf. I, no. <laughs> I'm not tone deaf. What you are is not good at matching pitch, but your vocal cords are a muscle. And this is what you, this is what you tell them. Your vocal cords are a muscle, you're just not good at matching pitch. And if you hadn't picked up a basketball for the past 25 years, how good do you think you'd be at shooting free throws? So it takes time to build the muscle and to have it connect to the ear. And particularly, the pop in the head voice is the thing that really gets people. Because they're down their chest voice, and then they get, you know, this is my mom singing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear. Right? <laughs> right? There's no birthday. Like, that's not. It's this. Everything is goes like this. But with time, and someone more patient than myself, she would have been able to do all of it. She actually got me good. She was like, my sister, and um, she was saying to me, like, my sister and I are singing at your wedding. And I went passion. And she was like, we're just kidding. <laughs> and went off. So, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was married quite a while ago. Pentatonics were three. So, yeah, 23 years coming up this month. So, anyway, all of this is to say, I think. When you are struggling with a situation in which you are telling your choir the same thing over and over again and they're not listening to you, you need to do what businesses have done from time immemorial, hire a consultant. <laughs> hire somebody to come in, a, a choreography coach, a rhythm coach, somebody who's inspiring to come in and work with your choir and tell them in advance this is the kind of stuff you want to work on and they can focus on it. And then in the end, they'll feel much better about themselves and then doesn't matter, you'll be like, I've been telling you you can do this for two years, and somebody comes in here and in two hours they pull it out of you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's really great. Because I love it because I get to go into work with all your choirs and afterwards. They're like, she's so great. You got us singing rhythms. And we're singing with emotion now. And isn't it amazing? And you guys are all like, uh -huh. <laughs> Amazing that he would ask you to sing with any emotion whatsoever. I should have thought of that. <laughs> 13 years ago when you joined. Right? So, but that's just the fundamental nature of it. And then it becomes part of the vocabulary, it becomes part of the, of the energy of the group. And, and, uh, and you're all just bigger people than that. Good question. So, uh, unless I'm mistaken, no one in your choirs was around in 1893 when the barbershop was really popular. <laughs> so, they are already able Maybe one or two. to genre hop and to stylistically time travel 50 years away from what I call the music of, of, of 
their lives. So, so basically, I think this has been pretty well proven scientifically, but uh, more within the animal kingdom. Birds have a certain period of time during the equivalent of their adolescence when the music they hear around them is imprinted upon them. And if it's a parrot, they might make car horns if they are living in the middle of Manhattan, right? Like, like <coughs> whatever they hear, the polymer cracker, they'll imitate. I mean, if they're not the cause, then they're singing the different songs they hear and all the studies have been done, et cetera, et cetera. We as humans have music that imprints upon us. And on average, from your teenage years into your early 20s, that's really, that's really the time, high school and college, you're listening to music, you're making memories, and that music becomes the music you love throughout your life. Now, other musics you can like, and also from your earlier preteen years, music you remember when you're really young, and maybe through your 30s, but the older you get, the more your musical tastes calcify, and the less you really have the energy to go out of your comfort zone and really hear it. So the, the real question is, how do you get somebody who's old or interested in something that is new to them? And if it's an older song, they're like, oh, this is a Beatles song I didn't really know, but this is a Beatles song I like it. Um, the first thing to know is that they're surrounded by this music pretty perpetually. Now, maybe not the latest Ariana Grande hit, but they've been listening to Madonna every time they've gone to the grocery store for the past four years. <laughs> but, you know, for better, for worse. For worse, honestly. Uh, with Madonna, uh, she's a great dancer. So. <laughs> Honestly, I really didn't get it. I have to tell you, I had, and I had to ask a couple of my friends. This is totally off the top, but I had to ask a couple of my friends who were gay. I said, like, because I was like, what? So she's such a gay icon. Like, what is it about Madonna? Because she doesn't have a pleasant tone of her voice. She doesn't have the grace. She doesn't sing particularly well. She isn't beautiful. She doesn't seem like a very nice person. Like, what is it about her that makes her compelling to so many people in the gay community? And, and he had an answer immediately. He was like, oh, it's her fabulousness. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, <laughs> and that explains share <laughs> and all of these things. And I was like, right, I'm impervious to fabulousness, and over here it's the most like I was like, I got it now. You're totally awesome. So anyway, all of this is, and that's beside the point. But all of this is to say they're probably not as far away as you think. Number one. Number two, if you're picking the right songs. There's a timelessness to the artist. So if you bring in a song by John Legend, you bring in a song by Ed Sheeran, Adele, they hear these songs and they could have been written 40 years ago. And maybe they're a little, little stylistic flourishes, but for the most part, it's just, it's just good music, good chords, good singing. You know, Ed Sheeran's not that far from James Taylor sometimes, right? And John Legend's certainly not that far away from, from being, uh, you know, a young Stevie Wonder or whatever at times. I mean, their, their phrasing's a little different and stuff, but you still get those characteristics in the song, the, the nature of the R&B stylings or whatever. So it's actually probably closer than you think. And you don't have to convince them that all popular music is great, just these couple songs. And they can probably get on board with that, I think, you know. Yeah. And then, and then if enough of them do, then they'll have to get kind of tugged along. Right. We want new modern music. <laughs> not that, not that. <laughs> yeah, they're like, no, 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 not that matter. Like, well, you know what you can do is you can ask a couple of them, I'll get you, just like, we can ask a couple of them and have them bring them to the songs. What do you like? And my, my, my daughter is playing this, or I heard this on the radio and I really like all this kind of stuff. Uh, and by the way, I did have, uh, there was an old pair we had uh, long ago, and uh, she's like from Brazil and had free Saturday night. She was like, you know, can you let me find this uh, Uncy music? I was like, Uncy, what's Uncy? She's like, Uncy. You know, <laughs> 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 crazy. When I was in Italy, when I was in Italy uh, in high school, we were performing there, and uh, the Italians they, they come to me. They say, "Oh, we love so much of this music you have, and they, this uh, my favorite one, this new one. You have Undue?" I was like, "I don't, I don't have Undue. What's Undue? You too? Oh, you too! I love you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah. <laughs> Own culture. So to make everyone happy, we're doing a Katy Perry medley. Cool. Perfect. All my young ones are on board. The old ones have not stopped liking. But perfectly the warm up for a good month before, that's what we warmed up to with Katy Perry. And so 
So smart. <laughs> they love it. Because, okay, now this is something that I learned when I was at the New England Conservatory of Music. Um, in the, it's back in the self producing studies now, it's called the Contemporary Improvisation Department. Your first year was basically to memorize like 120 different melodies from around the globe. And so I can tell you from experience that some of the stuff that I heard, I didn't like when I first heard it. But by the time you've heard it enough that you could have it memorized, you like it. You find the thing in it. Now, not everything, Madonna, but some of this stuff, <laughs> I'm giving her a hard time. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not great, but it's not that bad. But, but they'll find something about it, and particularly if they have experiences around it, because it, it reminds them of their warm-up music. That's brilliant, because then it's theirs. Right, they, they have a connection to it. They have, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. Oh, well, here, now you're ready for the next, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, right. Four pages, exactly. There it is. Leads, you already know the melody. Have a seat. Yeah, exactly. Right, bingo. No, that's great. That's really smart. And something I will also note, note is that, um, although I don't know if it's entirely the case within the speed island world, but I do know kind of in the contemporary acapella world, Groups that have varying ages, generally, <coughs> older groups are happy to have younger members and do younger music, but the younger groups aren't always happy to then make the big leap backwards. They're like, well, we're doing all music from the 80s and later. We don't really want to sing Bobby there or whatever. No, they can be learned and massaged, but I'm just letting you know the way you're going is actually the easier way. They get there, though. They totally get there. If kids come in doing younger stuff, and then you throw them all in, they're happy to do it. Of course, they, because they fall in love with harmony. That's the, it's, and that's why I tell so many music educators that uh, contemporary acapella is the gateway drug to all the harmony. Yeah. It's like, first one's free. They get you get it. <laughs> and then they love, they love singing, they love pitch perfect, they love connecting with others in harmony. And then you're like, I've got this other stuff over here. But I don't know if you're ready for it, but it's really cool. Um, it's this composer called Monteverdi, and he had this Whoa. really cool chords. You guys like cool chords? Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, there's this, this, uh, this uh, barbershop thing. Like, you guys, well, you probably, you don't know real barbershops. Like, well, if it's, no, 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 yeah, the real. So that's, it's, too, it's probably too hard for you. You probably couldn't say, what do you mean it's too hard? You know? <laughs> I'm with you on this. And then they love it. Start with the tag. Well, I'll teach you just the tag, because I don't think. And then they're like, what? Yeah. And in Camp Acapella, we each, the first night each year, we have a barbershop and we bring different groups for them. Runs Come and it's a Classic and GQ and the ladies. And, and um, it's just these, these kids love it. And then everybody's singing tags during snack hour, and then we can't get them to sleep. Because it's it's a part of it, and we have a oh, we have a barbershop academy here. People sign up like I want to know more about this. So it's you got to just get them, you can't get them in the door. And I will say also uh, the flip side of that is I think the effective way to get young singers in is not necessarily to say okay guys let's just sing music from 100 years ago because that's like trying to get someone to read. And it's like, here's George Eliot novel, and we're reading Jane Austen, and da 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 da. But I don't read so much. I haven't, you know, it's like, here's Cat in the Hat, here's Harry Potter. Hopefully you can skip Twilight. And, <laughs> and then you move your way, right? And then, you, and then you get up to the point where you're able to do that. And that's in part why. Twilight and Madonna. They're not, they're not for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, I read the first half of a, of a, of a, of a chapter of Fifty Shades of Grey. It is the worst <laughs> I've ever. Agreed. You got to get to book two. I couldn't make it. And now I'm a big reader. I'm total. We want Harry Potter. I'm total Raven. I read like eight books a year. So I read a lot, and I just I couldn't. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> how do you know that? <laughs> Ozzy, 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 yeah. Wait, oh, yeah, yeah. So, bottom line, bottom line, there's a way to get people and, and young singers into all of this, and there's a way to get older singers excited about younger music, and the good news is you've got Fulfill Harmony as the, the connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Brilliant idea. All right. I was wondering about uh, flow voice or how realistic it would be for, or any other online, how realistic it would be for like a 
smaller ensemble to do like an online concert? Um, I think Camp Acapella used low voice to do. We didn't. Uh, Acapella Academy did. Oh. We just we just live streamed <laughs> our stuff. We just put it for free up on Facebook, and everybody was watching. We had tens of thousands of viewers, mm -hmm. which was really great. Now. <laughs> we're streaming these completely dealt with in yeah. all of this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we got people wa watching young singers singing in a giant barbershop for us, and we got people sing hearing all these people sing. It's an amateur. Okay. We're not, we didn't charge tickets for anyone to come to concert. It's not about that. Eventually, do I think that kind of thing could potentially happen? Yeah, but I think Flow Voice right now is trying to get, it's all subscriber based, so people have to pay to watch it. So what I would do is I'd start by live streaming a little bit of rehearsal, let me know, and then all the friends and families are like, watch this rehearsal, we're gonna sing a couple songs just in rehearsal, and then they start following in the page, and they share, oh, that was a cool video, because as soon as you've done it, it pops up, and then you can share it from there, um, and you can upload a couple things to YouTube and kind of build your way out. Uh, so I would say that it's, it's an excellent promotional tool, which is generally what you need, not probably, uh, a real revenue source for you okay. as of yet. In time, once you get a really good following, then you can start turning in your YouTube page into little bits of ad revenue here and there. But generally speaking, you're going to make a lot more money from the specific tickets that you would sell to your concerts. Um, but far enough down the road. Like, if you have to ask, it's not time. Right? <laughs> You'll know. Like, oh, this is, you know, every time we perform, we make thousand dollars. So let's go, right? <laughs> or you make enough videos and one of them goes viral and all of a sudden you've got something to build on. Which is uh, one thing I'd re recommend to all of you guys. Music now is videos. Right? Getting mm -hmm. your group's faces on screen is so important. It's more important than albums. Like I'm telling college groups now, don't make a 12 song CD at the end of your school year. Make a four song EP and make a video for each of those four songs. You have so many more people experiencing your music, and you'll have something that is actually building and, and acapella and your group name and all that kind of stuff, right? When's the last time you bought a CD? I mean, I can't even play them anymore. In my car, I can't, but on my laptop, I can't. People give me CDs, I'm like, hey. <laughs> right? And so this technology is changing. Meanwhile, when I need to hear a song to arrange it, or I'm like, oh, what's that tune again, or whatever, I go right to YouTube, click on it, and there's the video, right? That's the future of what's going on in, in our music. So, Pentatonix, when they were on the sing-off, I don't know if you realize, season three, I produced the albums for the first two groups. And they were tied up, the label didn't really want them, but they had to take them, but that's something they want. And so they, they got handed off. When I was doing Milta, it was the administrative assistant who was in charge, who was their A&R person, which is like, it was insanity. We'd be picking a song, and I'd come in at 10 p.m. at night, and walk in the next day at 10 a.m. Oh, I changed my mind. I think you should, shouldn't do a pop song, you should do a folk song. Like, we're in the studio, what are you doing? So obviously neither of those groups, plus them, they had to get the management dictated, they were both calcified, they were stuck. And so when Pentatonix won, the next morning they were dropped by the label. It's like, you want a label deal, and now you're dropped. So I sat down with them and I said, guys, don't wait for anything to run. Go, do your thing, don't wait for any management to show up, don't wait for your phone to ring, make things happen. So they started recording, and they were really motivated, they recorded videos just in front of a white wall. Go look at their earlier videos. It's just five people sitting there singing. And they were good. And it built slowly, but people liked them and they had a really good sound and it built and it grew and it built and it grew. So, but people want real moments when they're watching videos. So don't think that you can just take um, a, a video of your last competition set or something like that shot from far away. No one's gonna be interested in that. They wanna feel like it's up close. They want to feel like they drop by your rehearsal. Like, like bring them in to the experience of acapella and vocal harmony rather than try to create something that's on the stage. Because as soon as it's on the stage, people's expectations change and they want something that looks like the Grammy Awards, right? Mm -hmm. They need a 17 camera shoot and they need amazing audio feed from the board that's been mixed and posted, blah, 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 blah. But they don't expect that when you're singing in the hallway. So that's. That's a good way to get those numbers up. So as a culture, I think we're kind of all a little afraid because of all the copyright stuff to do your live streaming, even if it's for a couple of songs at our rehearsal. Are we overly afraid? You, you're, you're, yeah, you're overdoing it. Okay, so first of all, um, 
nobody's, there's not enough money in the lawyers to make your life miserable. What'll happen is if, if you post something up on YouTube, if you've got a live stream, and somebody complains, it's the Jimi Hendrix estate, and they don't want versions of their song. Prince used to have, before he died, Prince was like, nobody could put anything up online, so you couldn't find any performance online. No, as soon as he died, and then it was like, oh, his brother's in charge, his brother doesn't care. Everything. Now there's stuff everywhere, right? Um, what's gonna happen is, if anybody doesn't like it, they'll just take it down. YouTube will just literally take it down. Facebook will say, oh, this song is a copyright violation by this, the people, whatever. If you think we're in error, let us know. That's it. It's like a cop walking by, like, you know you shouldn't walk in the middle of the street, you should go over the crosswalk. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's it. Really? But every single thing up online, generate new content as much as you can. The more content you have, the better you'll get at shooting the content, and the more more material you'll have as a community. YouTube has an automatic like back in compulsory license. So so the way it works with YouTube is everybody's assumed to be paid for that's up on YouTube with anything unless the songwriters complain. Yeah, I mean, there's not tons of money going through. That's the Spotify problem. Like, you're getting six cents when a million people hear your song, but, or it's $35 actually, but still, it's ridiculous. And it might be 10 million, yeah, whatever. But anyway, it's like, it's basically nothing. But there's enough money, and the law right now is saying that that's what it is. So. Yeah, make videos, make videos. <laughs> Questions? Any others? We just have a little bit more time, right? Okay, so what's the question that you're ashamed to ask, that you're afraid other people are going to judge you if you ask it? But you know, oh, the hand went right up. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one down here, too. Go. I have a question that I am, like, nervous to ask. That's fine. So as um, directors, we spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to work on and fix and this and that. And so, but we also are trying to connect with our chorus so they can connect with the audience. Yep. How on earth do we put ourselves in a vulnerable enough position without being terrified so that they can connect with us, we can connect with them, so that they can make that heartfelt connection so we can have an emotional performance. Ooh, it's a good question, and not one you should be afraid to ask, although uh, you're exhibiting the fear of asking, which goes hand in hand with the fear of actually performing. So uh, first of all, you should know, just remember, for yourself anyway, being afraid to ask that question would have kept you from ever getting an answer. What was the question? The question was basically, how do we, as, like, it's a two-level problem. You need your group to be able to perform <coughs> with vulnerability in front of an audience to really express certain kinds of music. But taking a step back from that, our group is afraid of being vulnerable while they're performing. So you're like two steps away from the actual ability to make this happen. So again, this is going to be one of the points that I'll talk about tomorrow morning with the Heart of Vocal Harmony. But I think you, you take steps toward it. You take, and it may be baby steps, but you can start by picking some music videos and showing the music videos of groups and performers that people really like. Maybe Sinead O'Connor singing, nothing compares to, it's just her face. You know, and there's a tear in her eye, and it's just awesome. Um, and you can also talk about a song, and what does this song mean? Plus, there's, there's the overarching making sure your choir is on board with what we're going to talk about tomorrow, which is without emotion, music is meaningless. There's no, nobody's going to care, right? Nobody wants to watch you just do your hobby, right? No one, no one wants to watch you build your model train set. So if you're a hobby of overtones, enjoy yourselves. Thank you, three people, right? That's not music, it's not performing. It's it's actually, it's like a vocal synchronized swimming. <laughs> You're synchronizing your muscles to do certain things that end up having this, this result, right? I'm being a little harsh on you, but I, but I, I want to be, because this is a tough love moment. Guys, you love singing. You love barbershop, you love your groups. And you might be making the mistake of thinking that these overtones are the things that you really love, but it's the connections you have within your choir. It's the true moments of emotional honesty that happen on a Tuesday night when no one's in the room and the lights are low, 
and you just create the sound. The sound has something to do with it, but it's not the point. So I'll bet your singers are actually closer to that point than, especially the newer ones. Like, I came here to have a good time. I came here to all that. Um, and then, and, and again, tomorrow this will come up a little bit. There's the word bravery in our society, which I think has been misunderstood since the Middle Ages. Like, someone who's brave kills a dragon. Or Harry Potter's brave. The people in Gryffindor are brave, but it's whatever. If you go back through that book, actually Harry Potter and his friends are stupid. The things you do are, are time and again not the smart things to do, right? Like literally, you're like, no, don't. It's 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 bad choices. Make good choices, Harry. Didn't make good choices. It's a good story. I still support it all, but um, bravery in our society is is speaking truth to power. In our society, there are no dragons. Bravery in our society, I mean, yes, there are there are combat veterans who are out there on the front lines, but they're not the only heroes. And often the word heroism is, is only used in that case. The person or the people in your group who are able to stand in a circle and really sing with emotion and show others. And then when they do that, the others will see that and say, like, wow, I think I can do that. In fact, you might even pull a quartet in front of your group and say, like, okay, let's try. And you'll deal with issues of, of people getting overwhelmed and all this kind of stuff. But it'll create, oh, and you feel the power of what the song can be. And then once you get to a tipping point, once you get to you know, the 100 monkeys syndrome, once you get to a point where enough of your singers will do it, then the ones who don't do it will be out of place and look weird. And then everybody jumps across the line, or most everybody. It becomes the norm. And you know, it's that, it's that who wants to volunteer thing, and everybody takes a step back, and a couple of people are forward, right? Then eventually, who wants to volunteer, a couple of people step forward, and then who wants to volunteer, most people step forward, and the ones on the line in the back are like, me too, because that's what everybody's doing. So you just need to find those leaders in your group, and you'll, you'll find them. And, uh, and let me know how it goes, because I'm curious. Like, that's, that's a huge question, and one that doesn't get asked as much, but that's the, like we were, I was saying about Tuny Fist, like there are books and books and books about Tuny Fist. Books about singing with emotion. We've got Tom's book in mind. I think that's it in the history of the Western canon when it comes to singing with emotion. And, and I'm not kidding. I wrote my book for that reason. I was like, because every time I'd go work with choirs, quartets, whatever, I would come up, they'd sing a song, and I'd say, uh, that was really nice. Okay, now let's get started. Before we start, let, just let me know like, what, what's the song about? Why are you singing it? What are you trying to put across? <laughs> All, not always, but almost always. And, and, then, and then, you know, it feels a little bit like a setup to the audience. And I have to say, like, guys, this isn't a setup. I need a thesis. I don't know, like, what if, if I'm supposed to change it, move your choreography, or like, I don't know what I'm supposed to. If I don't know what I'm supposed to feel, then I know that I'm that we have a problem. But more importantly, if I'm going to fix it, I want to, let's aim for the stars. Is this a song of loss? Are you trying to make people feel melancholy? Do you want them to feel like naughty? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you want them? You see what I'm saying? No, and here's the other thing. The, 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 the range of human emotion that we experience should all be able to be expressed through music. So you don't need it to be exactly like the original. You can have it be playful or sexy or crazy or fun or silly or whatever. And often before I go in the studio, I'll sit down with the group and, you know, small ensembles in a circle. Okay, what's the song mean to us? What do these lyrics mean? And when people start opening up and they talk about things that happen in their lives and their tears or whatever, we have a moment. And then I distill that moment down to a short phrase, two or three words, something that you as a director, when you write up on stage, right before you sing that and the pitch is being blown, say those couple words, and it helps trigger people into that moment and that discussion they had, and then you're good to go. And here's the thing that's going to happen for a lot of people in the course. Maybe there's a song of loss, and, and some of your younger singers, they, they have an experience loss, whatever, and then you talk about losing your mother or your wife. Changes the room. And then, believe it or not, she looks at him. There it is. That's what, it doesn't need to be hers. It just needs to be real. Um, and there was a group that a couple of years ago I was working with in uh, San Diego. The video's up online. Maybe some of you have seen it. And they were singing You Are My Sunshine. And, uh, and I was like, guys, I, I, like, 
I really like these, but I've got nothing here. I mean, that thing that song means nothing to me at all. It feels just like, hello. And, and, so, and I said, so what do we have? What's real? And, and one of the singers said, like, well, really? I was like, yeah, let's go. Oh, right? And he was my sunshine. It was like the whole room was just like oh. And then they sang it and it was glorious. It was powerful and moving and meaningful. And I didn't care, like I don't care if they're the best things I've heard all year. And right? So that's what we need. We feel it all, we experience it all. But we shouldn't shut off our lives and then go into rehearsal and pretend like everything's fine, like our fucking Facebook pages, right? It needs to be the opposite. It needs to be the opposite. That's when we flip things around. And then people are like, boom. And then a video of your rehearsal in a real moment and someone talking about something, whatever. Then that goes wildfire because people want those real moments. So that's what I'll leave you with, since I think we are pretty much at the time our real moments. Choose your songs based on real moments, real emotions that fit your group. Find out what in your group's lives relate to those, so that then when you're in rehearsal, they're all the singing and creating those real moments. And then when you get on stage, <coughs> it's a cakewalk. It's so easy. That's how they do it. They don't know how to do it any other way. Just like you want to teach them to not sing out of tune, they, 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 they also you know, sing in tune. In front of the audience, it's easier. And that'll be the thing. The vulnerability in your rehearsal over and over and over again. Then on stage, hopefully, that's how we do it. That's what we do. And the beauty they will feel, the power and the connection, the catharsis. That's the, that's the word. The catharsis that we feel when we have a truly meaningful, emotional experience with others is absolutely